Hi, and welcome back to the Mob Mentality Show. I'm Chris Lucian, and my co-host is Austin Chadwick. And today, uh, we have Jeff Langer, uh, Nick Godey, Merlin Tishauser, and uh, we are going to be talking a little bit about remote mob programming, uh, rapid reteaming, and uh, being an outsourced mob. So, um, but first, uh, you know, maybe let's do some quick inter introductions, uh, starting with Jeff, and we'll kind of go in that order. Sure thing. Happy to be here. Uh, thanks. My name is uh, Jeff Langer. I've been building software. Ooh, I edited it up. It's across five decades now, if you count from the early 80s to the 20s. Um, love this stuff. Still do. I've been running a consultancy for about two decades. Uh, doing mob programming probably for the bulk of the past half dozen years. I've used it uh, you know, day to day. We'll talk about that today, as well as I've introduced it in training situations, and it works darn good in that circumstance but yeah that's it thank you hi i'm nick Godey. um i've been uh programming since i was in elementary school and uh, professionally as a software developer and coach for about 20 years now um that's pretty much that merlin i'm from europe so apologies for my accent i'm dutch i live in close to amsterdam um <laughs> also you know I should buy a T-shirt. It's funny having the same age as old people because uh, I'm almost as old as Jeff, and he's the ultimate old person, I guess. Um, introduced to extreme programming in 2010-ish, I think. Uh, more programming 2015. Uh, used it as a coach and was forced to do it in the last year as a developer, which was, you know, good fun. <laughs> Yeah, that's it, I guess. Awesome. Well, uh, we, we, yeah. we, I was just going to, sorry to interrupt. I, I, we agreed right. to bring Merlin on only because we thought we might be able to finagle a trip to Amsterdam at some point, which never happened. <laughs> fail, <so>. fail. <laughs> <laughs> I only joined because I wanted to go to New York, but I yeah. failed as well. So, you know, <laughs> room for improvement. We had a team building trip. That's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That was our excuse. All right. Well, uh, that's a good segue <laughs> into our first topic, which is uh, remote cross-continental mob programming. Uh, so, yeah, maybe talk a little bit about it. Yeah, we all were forced to go remote three years ago, and uh, I think at least a few of us had done some work with a major U.S. auto manufacturer where we started there live and then transitioned to remote back in, obviously, March of 2020. Um yeah, this has been a little different in that we had people across four different time zones. So I'll bounce over to Nick and he can maybe elucidate on that. And then we'll yeah, I mean, Merlin came in later so he can bounce in a little later for that. Yeah, I mean, luckily we were able to agree on a pretty uh, nice set of uh, like core hours over which we uh, um, were all available to uh, to work. Everybody was very – I have – a uh, a two year old at home, and everybody was very nice to accommodate mostly my normal schedule. But uh, um, Merlin has the hardest uh, uh, shift, I think, <laughs> at least the most hours for sure. Um, yeah, but it was also a great opportunity, you know. Uh, you know, like Jeff said, three years ago, and no mis misunderstanding, COVID was horrible. Uh, but for me personally, it brought some good stuff because you know everyone went remote. So for me, it was a big opportunity to to work in the States and companies were totally cool with it. However, when I joined this team, <laughs> our you know account manager, he said, sure, Merlin is happy to do a Pacific time. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> but Jeff and, and Nick were really cool. And also Stephanie were really cool on that because Stephanie is actually, uh, we were a team of four. And Stephanie's based in San Francisco, so she was working in Pacific. And I'm close to Amsterdam, so we really, well, have the globe, right? But we, we followed Eastern, right, Nick and Jeff? Yeah, Eastern was yeah, pretty pretty much Eastern, yep. So, so Merlin, what time did it mean you were working? What was your hour range roughly every day? Yeah, well, local time for me was I started at 3 p.m. Um, in the afternoon, obviously, uh, up until 11 and you know and i found actually <laughs> re-experience it today there is one big pitfall one big mistake you can make my day started about 12 hours ago 
<laughs> uh, you know, I went to the school of my kids. I went to my own university. I did groceries, all that kind of stuff. And then it's 9 p.m. You think, oh, yeah, <laughs> you're supposed to be funny in a, in a podcast show. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'd want quite as much hour shift as, uh, as you had. But uh, there is something nice to having the, the morning free so you can get some stuff done instead of the evening free when uh, you can't do anything uh, outside of the house. Absolutely. Well, at least adult adult uh, chore type things you can't do. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's actually one of the more uh, rigid hour structures I've ever been through, usually with the mob and particularly with a few more people, let's say four or five in a team instead of three to four. We started with three, mm -hmm. uh, went to four. Uh, but yeah, I, I usually it was more a little a little more fluid where people would kind of come and go. Uh, we managed to somehow synchronize all four of those time zones. So let's see, there's West Coast US, there's Mountain, there's Eastern, and then that's uh, Central European time. Is that what that is? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. So we managed to synchronize it all. And the thing that was hardest for me, I think, was the lunch hour. So Merlin, uh, being East Coast, had a very strict lunch deadline, which was uh, 10 a.m. my time. So I never ate lunch at 10. I would uh, take a sneaky little break around noon 30 or so and then quick, quickly fix myself something. Yeah. Merlin, Merlin's dinner was about the same time as my as my lunch. Yes. So that was convenient, then... at least. There's exactly six hours right between Eastern and Central European. So what was noon for Nick was a spot on dinner time for my family. And we also, I think, for, we worked as a team for a whole year, right? And I think we were pretty strict on the times, but they did work out for us. You know, yeah. we started at 9 and have lunch at 12. It was just, just the rhythm we got into. And also, but we might dive into that a little bit later, but one of the things that really made it work pretty well is that we were pretty relaxed. You know, whatever uh, happened at home that needed attention or had priority, that had priority. And uh, no questions asked, no, no need to explain or to apologize. And that really helped a lot. Yeah, I agree. Everybody was very chill about uh, that sort of stuff, and that helped a lot. Does, uh, did you have any, um, I guess, strategies around maintaining context or if there was like any hour hour offset or anything like that? Or did uh, was there anything special that you were doing that you felt was only necessary because of these time differences? I mean, we did have some times where uh, Stephanie, who's not with us because she was on Pacific time in the farthest shift, she'd sometimes um, look into uh, bugs or try to reproduce issues or things like that after uh, the rest of us had... Uh, um, called it a day and uh, sometimes she she had to uh, to leave notes or sometimes I would talk to her on slack in the uh, in the evening about stuff to try to get context before we would come in okay. the next day but that's about the only thing that comes to mind for me nice. yeah I'm not thinking of anything else she was a de facto bug finder slash a person who understood everything we had to know about basically all the nuts and bolts of the customer's administration mm -hmm. processes and whatnot so it was really cool to have and we didn't assign the role, but she naturally gravitated toward it. So that was actually kind of cool. And the the time shift that she was dealing with uh, made it work well for her. She wasn't going to roll out of bed as early as I was. So she would typically come in maybe an hour or so later. Yep. Yeah. Nice, nice. So uh, obviously you you prescribe this for every team in the world that your your core hours will work for everybody. No, mm -hmm. <laughs> just kidding. Well, um, we were going to hire somebody in India, but yeah. You know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so, uh, what I guess what I was uh, trying to get at was how did you land with your core hours? Was it there some experimentation? Was it you know some dice being rolled, or you know uh, how, how did you how did you land with what you got? Merlin wasn't there at the outset, so we really only had to deal with the four U.S. time zones mm -hmm. minus Central, which we didn't have. Well, actually, the customer is on Central, so yeah, I forgot about that. So our customer that we built the software for, rebuilt some software for, was on Central Zone. Um, so most of it, though, I think did gravitate around what Nick's rest of, both, both of us, Stephanie at the time, really didn't care. Um, so we gravitated toward Nick's schedule because he's the one who had the biggest demands from personal need. Yeah, I think also the client uh, requested that we be available. I forget the exact hours, but something like 10 to 3 central or something like that, which happened to line up okay with what we ended up doing. Cool, 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 cool. 
Yeah, yeah. and also, I'm oh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, Go please, ahead. please. <laughs> yeah. uh, one thing that came to my mind: this, this you no, know, we all have been mobbing before, but this was for a year and also forty hours a week. We did it five days a week, and it was practically the whole day. So it was pretty intense from my point of view you know i've been mobbing before but usually it was three four hours a day and then you know we, we did other stuff but it was day in day out you know and those core hours really worked for us and also the days worked for us so that was uh this has been by far the most intense and most ex lengthy mobbing session i've been part of oh cool 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 yeah, and I guess what I'm learning from your experience, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, there's so many factors, person to person, team to team, and even the client, as you were talking about, right? So, uh, you know, we're currently, um, Chris and I are experiencing more diversity of time zones and things with mobs. And so it's fascinating to hear your experience. And actually, the serendipity of timing is quite wonderful <laughs> talking to y'all. Um, and so I guess what I'm gleaning from it is it's not like you can say, okay, these 10 mobs are all going to have the same core working hours. That's likely to wow. cause a lot of problems, right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's like each mob figures out what works, right? And so, yeah, like you said, family stuff, stuff going on, you know, being, you know, what uh, Merlin's doing might be really problematic for some people, but it sounds like it worked for you, Merlin, right? <laughs> yeah. But also, it also worked because we mm -hmm. allowed uh, freedom. You know, mm. so I, I'm, you know, Jeff mentioned it very briefly. We had natural roles in the team. Mm -hmm. Stephanie was great as a bug finder or a QA person. I was great as being the grumpy old man, you know, so <laughs> I could become very grumpy, especially when my time zone progressed and I was getting tired. But it was totally cool for me to say, ah, you know, I'm if I stay on a little bit longer, I probably will do real damage <laughs> in the team structure. So I, I gotta call it. <laughs> you know, and that that was one of the great things. And that's I think that's also pretty essential to to make it work. Yeah. You know, I think and, yeah, That's a big uh, advantage to both mobbing and uh, remote work, I think, is that it allowed us, it made it easier for that sort of flexibility to um, to be a thing. I think when people show up to an office, there's this kind of feeling that when somebody shows up late, they're late, and that's like a bad mm -hmm. thing that I feel like isn't uh, isn't necessarily as uh, baked in when you're uh, working remotely. I think the interesting thing about that is like uh, it, we know that you can come and go in a mob. And I think just because we were so cool about how we interact with uh, with each other, what the kind of rules or lack of rules was, uh, that we kind of gravitated more towards what can we actually do to try to be there when the rest of our team needs us. So in some sense, I think it helped cohere the team into basically just want to be there more at the same time to support each other. Mm -hmm. Kind nice. of the person law of personal mobility, kind of the open space principles. Um, but also I think uh, you know, that that whole like office environment when you see somebody walk in, it, it's uh, you know, that just reminds me of the fundamental attribution error. It's like, oh, they came in at 9 15, so they must be a bad person, right? Like that that sort of thing is <laughs> um yeah, it it just doesn't exist nearly as much uh in in a remote environment and so then you you can have you know you can have more realistic conversations about you know other things when you're not just trying to figure out if there's a body in a seat in an office <laughs> yeah yeah and, and also for me at least but i think uh, nick and jeff might agree hopefully uh it also shows the strength of a mob you know the resiliency of a mob that even with four people uh, the mob is resilient enough to cover for one missing or even for two missing. And it can be, you know, for an hour or sometime during a day. But I'll, I also had a huge personal uh, event happening somewhere in June that I had to log off for two weeks. And, you know, the mob was strong and resilient enough to, to able to cover that. It did not slow us down. And, you know, after that event was passed, you could just move in again. And that's, you know, for me, showing the resiliency of, uh, of mob programming. 
yeah, I think to that point, both uh, both with being able to continue on when somebody was away, but also uh, that person being able to uh, integrate back in quickly when they yeah. uh, when they returned. Nice. Yeah, and I think I'm wondering if you've ever struggled yourself or seen someone kind of struggle through this kind of uh, entering and exiting the mob. Uh, kind of like the relaxed mindset, if you guys have said, or the flexible mindset. Um, yeah, have you? Is there anything that's helped you? Because I've noticed. Um, I think was it? Uh, did Jason Kearney write an experience report on it, Chris? I'm trying to think. Uh, yeah, uh, we'll put it in the show notes. But I, I think that it can be a transition for some people. They're like, if I've missed a half an hour of mobbing, I've like, I've missed, I've the fear of missing out or something, right? Or so and so is not here, so I don't feel like we can move forward, or you know. Yeah. Any of these kind of concerns? Have you had to work yeah, through any the, of these? <laughs> the Jason Kearney uh, article is yeah. in the Big Agile Proceedings, and it is from uh, it's, it's titled "My First Team," I believe. And okay. uh, he talks about when he first joined our mob, uh, he he felt like he had to be there all the time, and that if he walked away, he would miss so much because everything was moving very quickly. Mm. and uh he was getting anxiety and panicked about it and then like finally he went to take a break and he he was just very um anxious about it and then uh he had somebody kind of stop him while he was getting coffee and like just was like chit-chatting with him and then and then he was like you know he, he was in a situation where he felt so pressured to get back to the team and this was mobbing in person and so you know there's a lot of pressure on him i guess from that regard and uh, and so, it was, you know, it's it's a, a very animated and great article if, if people have time to look at it. But uh, yeah, there is this, um, you know, I think people have to learn that you could be OK with losing and regaining context just, you know. Yeah, I can imagine, you know, I think it's also dependent on the intensity or the complexity of the, the project you're working on. And I, I don't want to talk negatively about the past project, but it was mainly front-end development. You know, a pixel is a pixel. <laughs> you know, it's not like we're solving huge problems on the spot or something. Sometimes, you know, sometimes we got really uh, tricky defects we, we needed to to hunt down. But in general, we it, it, I can imagine a really complex or really advanced development practices that might be a thing. But for us, it was usually quite trivial. And what you do is just summarize it. You know, when someone returns what we have done in the past, you know, we, we did this, we did this, implemented this. Uh, we can show it to you and then you move on. So sometimes you have to slow down as a mob to allow the other two to catch on again. Yeah, I think there's also a, uh, like a team culture um, factor there because I've definitely worked on teams where everybody was very cool with some people not knowing as much as other people and with explaining things and maybe even having somebody that their first time programming was when they joined the mob because they weren't a, you know, a professional programmer um, as part of the uh, the team or what have you. And I worked on other other teams where everybody didn't know how to handle that uh, situation, and it's definitely puts more pressure on uh, on people if if that's the case. Uh, I think it also helped that uh, kind of to Merlin's point, there wasn't a lot of like. Um, we definitely learned things that were useful later on in the project, but it wasn't, um, we weren't building up this like huge domain model or anything like that in our, our mind that we all had no, to, exactly. uh, to keep track of, um, which definitely made things uh, more straightforward. We did have moments early on where we just had to stop and kind of uh, you know, make sure everybody was uh, comfortable with, let's say, just a language feature or how something works in React or whatever. Uh, so, you know, at the moment, it's like, uh, you're not keeping up. Sure, let's stop. Let's talk about this and make sure you're comfortable. We take anywhere from a, a half hour to an hour to dig into. Let's let's maybe work through a few examples of what we're talking about. Uh, and I think that helped quite a bit. Uh, as far as, yeah, I mean, in the past, I've found that you keeping things granular and tiny and focused on a unit test was always exceptionally, exceptionally helpful in terms of focus. So you could leave the room, come back later, and then 
basically all you need to know is what's the current test? What are we trying to get accomplished for the small increment? We didn't have a lot of unit testing on this project. There was some stuff earlier and Merlin came a bit later after we worked mm -hmm. through some of this, but uh, we had, it was kind of legacy code rescue in some senses. So there's a lot of complexity early on. We did add a bunch of tests to help that out, but we didn't do a whole lot of TDD, particularly not once uh, we delivered the first release. After that, it was primarily, okay, we've kind of figured everything out, where everything is. And yeah, it was more, let's say, UI level stuff that was fairly easy to ramp up on. You know, what are you doing at the moment? Yeah, we were also, at least uh, um, Jeff, Stephanie, and I all kind of were taking a cold plunge into the uh, into this code base at the same uh, time. So I think we all sort of had a shared uh, ignorance that helped uh, us uh, us be comfortable with, uh, you know, any individual ignorances we might have. Uh, you all have lifted, listed here some uh, rapid reteaming. Uh, was that part of this cross-continent experience as well? <laughs> um, go ahead, Nick. Well, so originally... So originally there was supposed to be a different uh, fourth person on our team and uh, think things didn't work out. And then we had a temporary person on the team that had to step away. And then finally Merlin came. So there was some, there was some juggling of, uh, of team composition in the first uh, several months of the project. I forget the exact timeline now because it's all kind of a blur. But, I think uh, you started in September, right, with with the first person, and he got moved out in October, something like that. Yeah, it was like the very end of September, yeah. and then yeah, somewhere in somewhere in October. I tried to get out for the whole year, but I failed. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in this experience, uh, were there any, you know, I guess challenges to bringing in a new team member, or was it just feel natural? Um, any anything like retrospectives play into this anything like that at all um you know merlin was really the only one after that that came on board we did introduce a well, the customer team introduced a new ux person in there but it, it all just kind of flowed naturally um merlin maybe you can talk a bit about how you felt coming on board um yeah, what really helps, we already knew each other, right? We're working in the same consultancy company. We worked with Nick before, worked with Jeff before, uh, knew Stephanie. Uh, that that helped, of course. Um, for me, the, the biggest, uh, that's also, the, the, I'm hesitating a little bit because it might not be really relevant for the mobbing, but it was also the turning point of, switching from a full-time coaching position to full-time software development because this mm -hmm. was a software development gig. And so the, the biggest adjustment for me personally was not necessarily getting into the team and knowing the people, but letting go of your coaching attitude <laughs> and being comfortable again in, okay, I'm not here to educate. I'm not here to coach, not here to train not to introduce new practices whatsoever. I'm here to make sure that shit is getting done, you know? So that's kind of interfering with what ordinarily might be in, being introduced in a team. But also, uh, I think it went very naturally. Um, you know, the big shock was the first couple of days, obviously. And, but after a week or so, it, I, I think we were a pretty good team. <laughs> it might have been different when there were really, you know, um, conflicting personalities or something like that. But I, I think we got pretty well along, uh, even with me being a grumpy old man lots of the times, but they bear <laughs> it out. <laughs> did, you ever, did you ever have to say, get off my lawn? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe yeah, once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> I think all of us did. But yeah. I think that's natural. Um, and, you know, I'll, maybe I can bring up something that did come on later is um, 
this was not the most fun project any of us have ever done. And in some ways, it's maybe one of the more frustrating some of us have been in, involved with. And I'm not going to go into a lot of details there. But, uh, you know, the nature of the work wasn't too bad. As we got later in the project, it did gravitate more toward it's just pure pixel. Um, we won't use the F word here, but pixel movement stuff. I mean, it was very <laughs> tedious, very not interesting. And uh, some of us <laughs> don't have the stomach to sit still all day for doing something like that. And I think we made a mistake by not doing one of the things that most people recommend with mob programming, which is to switch the driver a little more frequently. Um, and I think we, at that point, we're all kind of resigned to we're almost done with this. Let's just ride it out and not worry too much at this point in time about fixing some of the problems. But yeah, I would literally start nodding off if I wasn't going and surfing somewhere else while Merlin was going on for about, you know, 20 minutes, just trying to figure out how to center something within a div. Um, <laughs> one CSS yeah. thing I still don't know how to do right. <laughs> like, we that definitely had some, we definitely had some moments where like, several of us would just kind of nod off and one person would be a <laughs> runaway driver and the other person <laughs> that was paying attention would be like, no, we need to stop this. And they, but it would, because it was only them, it would just kind of slide off for a little too, uh, too long. So that's definitely right. a, uh, yeah. a thing and we could have better. Well, sometimes it was also just embarrassing. You know, to <laughs> me, it felt embarrassing that, you know, be, working with Jeff Langer and I, uh, you know, I see Jeff Langer as one of the godfathers of OOP, right? Of how do you do proper I think programming. he just called you old, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Grandfather. Did you say great-grandfather? I'm not there. And, you know, and then, then I saw him struggling <laughs> with knowing if it should be 20 pixels or 24 pixels or 16 yeah. pixels. And I just, <laughs> I just felt, right you know, let, let me do this. I, you know, I, I got you <laughs> go, whatever you want to do and I will fix this, you know? So that, that, that's also, Remind you know, me. from, yeah. It reminds me a little bit of a story. Uh, you know, we we had so so some of our mobs had dedicated UI UX people, and so, um, you know, we a lot of the time it would be you know build complex you know systems, and then and then have somebody who's really into the art, like really passionate and enjoys it, work on that stuff. Um, and then uh, we also had kind of the opposite of uh teams that were of mob you know we had mobs that were that did not have the support of of like dedicated ui ux people and um and what, what i saw them end up doing is a lot of these uh like kind of katas there's like a fruit css kata where you're like making the fruit move around and like you know joining them and all this other stuff and so uh and so those teams had um I, I had kind of observed them going through and, you know, spending like four hours of the, their day doing katas and CSS and then and then the other four hours of their day working on on that. Uh, and but yeah, it, it's really uh, it is really tough, especially if it's like not a passion of somebody uh, in the group. So, yeah. Yeah, but I also just realized that it was also due to the size of the mob, right? Because we yeah. were just with the four of us. So if we had been a little bit bigger, let's say six or seven people, yeah. we probably at that point would create a breakout room and, you know, split off, go work on, on the CSS while we'll do uh, some other stuff. But uh, we just kept with the four of us and we, you know, accepted it when someone dozed off or, you know, came a little bit dominant. <laughs> I'm guilty. <laughs> Let me do this. I know how to do it. Right, no, it's, a, but, it's a different discipline, I think, in, entirely. Yeah. And it requires yeah. a different eye, right? Um, yeah. I've definitely worked with some developers too that were willing to like get out the rulers and start doing it like, and seem to like that sort of uh, fiddly uh, <laughs> business. And then a bunch of a bunch of people um, don't necessarily like I don't particularly mind it one way or the other but uh, some people get uh, very frustrated by it and some people you know like you said are drawn to it naturally um, yeah it was also a strange dynamics of this project right where four I would say seasoned technical coaches <laughs> you know are finding themselves in a mob with four being forced to do front-end development you know it's it's 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I thought we did a pretty good job of going back to the earlier topic of not like coaching each other. I've, I've definitely worked with uh, yeah. um, groups trying to usually smaller things, but groups trying to do software development where everybody was, had been doing a lot of coaching type stuff on the yeah. team and everybody couldn't get out of, out of that mindset and was constantly trying to switch into coaching mode uh, throughout and yeah. you just don't get anything done. <laughs> No, I totally agree. We we managed to stay away from that. I think you know that's uh... yeah. We didn't really have a lot of disagreements over much of anything. I mean, in terms of you know, code style or you know, what the next test should be or whatever. I mean, everybody just kind of fell in the flow and it worked really well. Except uh, for the I reverse did... grid item. Except for the root. Oh, <laughs> some people did not like some of the elements we built. Some people are not here to defend. Why not? <laughs> Um, yeah, one other thing I noticed, it was an interesting, um, I've, I've done enough mobs uh, of differing sizes, and three was really interesting. You did generally stay engaged for the most part throughout the day. Um, I still checked out every once in a while. I'll, I'm definitely guilty of that. But more often than not, it, it kind of moved along and you had to pay attention if you were going to keep up at all. So uh, with four, when we moved to four, I, I think, uh, unfortunately, I recognize that well, I could probably take a little bit more mental break uh, here and there throughout the day. So you know, with the larger team size, and I've, I've been in some mobs where it's like six or seven people, and you can definitely look around the room when we, this was all live, uh, when we were doing that, and see people start to check out, uh, you know, one way or another, some almost falling asleep. Yeah, in my experience, I feel like that's the plus and the minus for mob programming over, say, pair programming is that um, in pair programming, there's kind of either there's one of two states, either the person that you're pairing with is not paying attention at all or not being allowed to pay attention, depending, <laughs> or they're, you know, completely glued to uh, to everything and it gets exhausting. Um, in mob, pro mob programming, especially as the mob gets a little larger, it is, you know, it's okay. It's not devastating for you to uh, to mentally step away for five, ten minutes and um, either be thinking about the next thing or just thinking about your cat at home or whatever. Um, that's not the end of the world. I actually appreciated the dynamic team size stuff throughout the day, too. It's like, uh, you know, after a while, I recognized that it was a problem with four. <laughs> and, and when one of us disappeared for an hour, it's like, okay um things seem to pick up a little bit uh when we went down to pairs uh, occasionally i actually found that was uh awesome time um getting back to this two people just had to have focused on something uh, but still yeah you know, we absolutely did better as a whole team you know the the resulting software uh we had some solo stuff done by folks we had some pair stuff and you could look at that and distinctly tell the difference between what was done by one person versus the mob or even the pair. Nice, yeah. nice. Yeah, and I can I can attest to that too. Where, um, when the mob gets smaller, even goes down to a pair, you know, it, you do kind of go into that hyper engagement where you're always driving or navigating, which is fun for a while. But then when the third person comes back from the meeting, you're like, oh, this is nice. Now I can look for code smells better or think about automation more, things like that. And I I've seen that too as well when uh, doing UI UX pixels, as you guys said. Uh, <laughs> that um, one cool thing I've noticed about mobbing is there's usually at least two focused on getting the pixels just right, where a third or fourth person is like, okay, well, how are we going to test this? Should we test this? Should we be automating this? I remember one time we were doing something like that. And then someone came up with a Python script to like auto do what we were doing for other pages as well, or something like that. And so, um, yeah, and, and I think you're right. So it's uh, like, like we were saying with the cross continent stuff, you know, to find your core working hours, you, Experiment with the different roles, different sizes, and find what works for that very specific context. So that, that's awesome. Um, uh, one of the items you all had on here was uh, being an outsourced mob. Uh, what, what do you mean by that? So we were we were doing a, like a software development contract for a uh, for a for a client um, that was paying our uh, um, our employer at the uh, at the time, and uh, so that kind of that changed some of the uh the dynamic because we had to uh we had to do certain things on on their terms um and also affected somewhat our availability to um to the 
resources at the client that knew things that we needed to uh, to know, which I think we didn't have as much leverage over, perhaps as we might have had if we were employed directly by the uh, um, by the client. Although I think in our case we got fairly lucky with most of of that. Um, the the person that was kind of the product manager was was pretty available for us and would actually hang out. So, uh, with us in the uh, in the mob, so that we could ask questions. Although not always, but uh, enough that uh, we were able to get through things. Not for lack of asking, we did ask for a dedicated person, and actually, we we all kind of felt it would have been really nice to at least have a developer who had worked on this product in the team. But they did not have any availability for that, and in fact, the very few people they had that. Uh, they only had a very few people that had ever worked on the product in the first place. So this was a lot of uh, digging and uncovering for us. But yeah, Luis, our product manager, as mentioned, and we we, we could typically coordinate when we were going to be able to talk to them through the day. And I think that was generally enough. There was only a few times where I felt like, ooh, we're kind of uh, spinning wheels until we get an answer from the product manager. Yeah, the, yeah. the hardest thing I think was they had a, a UI designer that was uh, – giving us figmas to uh, to build off of and um they weren't always uh as available to uh, to ask questions of and that no, led that, to the class that led to the classic problem of us doing stuff that they thought was really easy but actually was really hard and we'd spend a bunch of time on it before it would eventually get ironed out that maybe we shouldn't do it that way yeah, and that's the offshoring or the outsource component, right? Because for me, the real power of a mob is when you're able to pull in a QA person if you need them, or mm -hmm. the ops guy, which some companies have, you know, please come join us. Um, and then it's really this shows the strength and the power of a mob. And we, you know, the way the client was structured, that was simply not an option. Uh, mm. There were definitely times that we got stuck on, you know, specifics of how a Lambda was being deployed in AWS. And we didn't have access to AWS. We didn't have access to the logs whatsoever because mm. we were an outsourced team. And that really slowed us down. And, you know, we're XP guys. <laughs> we want to go fast in a, in a good, consistent way. And so being an outsourced team, not having direct access to uh, people like that, but also, for example, being forced to do pull requests that that was and the delayed feedback on that, that was really an annoyance <laughs> that made it really hard at times. But on yeah, the I mean, other hand, we learned how to deal with it. Yeah, the, the client was also very like role based and individual uh, work on individual tasks. So that like they weren't used to collaborating the way that that we found yeah. normal. Where um, uh, we yeah. did see a little bit of success is Luis. Every once in a while, he'd be like, oh, "I'm just going to hang out in the Zoom room and turn off his audio. Uh, I'm sorry, his <laughs> microphone rather, so that he kind of be overhearing us as he was working on something else. And every once in a while, he'd just kind of unmute and say, um, "Maybe you're not quite fully understanding it, right? Let me clarify things for you." So. <laughs> That was really cool having them just sit in the room virtually with us. And that was pretty effective. It's too bad we yeah, couldn't but, have gotten the rest of the folks to do that. Yeah, but it's also, that's one of the things I think with remote mobbing and working remotely. But there definitely have been times that I said, if we only were in the office, you know, I would grab the large trout, walk up to the other desk and start hitting people until they decide to come helping us. <laughs> but you can't do that remote. You know, you're bound to a Slack channel. Please help us. <laughs> you can't walk to another cubicle and, you know, slap someone. You know, just as a way of speaking, of course, I would not really slap people. But there have been times that I wanted sure. to. <laughs> not sure about that. <laughs> we need you... a, a fish-based yeah. fish robot, you know. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or a smoked yeah. salmon, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Or or you need like a remote way to equivalent. You know, did you try faxing, texting, calling, <laughs> chat, messaging, emailing all at the same time to send a message, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. I can't hey, uh, doing that. Yeah. A small segue on that is one thing I did find was uh harder for me personally for remote uh, work is that uh when uh, when I worked in an office and we'd be mobbing or or whatever and we'd run into something where we felt like we had to stop and make some diagrams and kind of discuss things 
I, I felt like it was harder to be engaged in that process um, when we were, uh, when we were remote than when we were actually, than when I was physically gathered around a, like a whiteboard hmm. or, uh, or the like. Um, I think some of that is just the, the lack of immediacy and the tools you're using and things like that. But hmm. yeah. 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 Drawing is a, was a big transition for us going remote um, and figuring out the tools and you're right. It's never, it's never one for one, but you find your, uh, your, your, your favorite tools to to draw with the team. Yeah. You, you guys mentioned something with um, a, a, a pattern, I guess, a situation that I've seen a few times. And I'm really curious if you had any thoughts on it, which is you have a, like an XP team or a mob or, you know, something kind of on that end of the spectrum uh, working with uh, something on the other end of the kind of uh, method, method uh, philosophical spectrum. <laughs> uh, did, was there any things that helped kind of connect the dots between the two? Um, you know, I remember one, uh, one time I was talking with my coworkers and he's like, do they think we're like, you know, the, the hippies in the wood or do they think we're like Martians? Like, you know, like how, how you know, how weird are we being right now? You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I don't want to speak for uh, Luis, but I got the feeling that he um, became aware fairly early how fast we were um, getting the work done and nice. uh, able to, uh, to, sh to show it. And I think that that led to a lot of, um respect for the way that we were um working yeah i think luis is the only reason we survived i mean <laughs> the customer themselves really knew nothing about the thing we were changing uh they had maybe a few people who were almost always busy so yeah having luis be able to sit with us and incrementally work through things i mean we were touching points with them every day uh every little feature that we did which was anywhere from one to five days for the most part um yeah it was a really important to have that ability to bounce everything back off of uh, luis and get clarification on everything yeah and also what i think is important to to realize is that when i was being asked to to join as a fourth person on on the mob management said hey there are four people now and if we split them up in two pairs, things will probably go quicker, you know. Um, and you could even do, you know, extend working day because you got one in Europe, you got one at Eastern. And so you can have a pair working early hours. You can have a pair working late hours. And that was being brought to us, you know, the client wants you to consider pairing or even soloing and we simply said no <laughs> it will slow us down uh it, it instead of going faster uh, we will not do it and they they kept asking for it i think for a month or so not jeff and nick it was somewhere in february there, yeah. march yeah and we just no we don't do it <laughs> It's funny. It that right eventually, they accepted it because we we kept delivering. So you know, the... yeah. Um, I worked on a on a uh, XP team way back when, and so uh, we got up to about eight people. And somebody decided we would go in management. Decided we would go faster if we split into two teams of four, but worked on the same work as each other. And after being at loggerheads for like two weeks, we just started working together again, and nobody said anything after that. It was pretty funny. <laughs> Yeah, it happened uh, one of the prior to this last engagement uh, where I worked with the team we did. We had four folks split into two pairs and two days into it, the uh, we ended up spending a few hours on merge hell, which is kind of ridiculous for two days of effort. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's impressive. <laughs> and no one, no one really knows the synchronization cost and, and they don't talk about it. They don't know it. They just don't. Not a, not an understood thing very well. And so it's like well, right. Uh coordination costs. I mean, the upfront planning periods, daily stand-ups, all that stuff adds up to quite a bit of extra time that nobody ever accounts for. Yeah. Also, it gives the it gives people the freedom to start scaling even more. And then you get that thing where there's all of a sudden there's 200 developers working on something that probably should have had eight. Um <laughs> <laughs> we saw one of those. <laughs> <laughs> nice nice fantastic well this has been a, a joy chatting with you all and 
I have more questions and things, but we're at time. So uh, I'm going to have to start clo- start closing it down. But before we do, is there anything you'd like to share or plug? Uh, maybe starting with uh, you, Merlin, and uh, going around. Oh, I'm prepared. I don't have a plug. Yeah, I'm currently without a client. So <laughs> reach out to me on LinkedIn if you have something fun to do. I'm definitely open for new engagements. I can work, you know, Eastern. <laughs> <laughs> if you ask very nicely maybe central <laughs> now that that's about it i love to be on the show thank you yeah thank you very much for having us on the show i'm also between gigs at the uh at the moment um so would i'm uh, looking for remote uh work primarily but uh be happy to uh, to talk to anyone who has something interesting in the um, software development and or uh, coaching areas. This is an odd coincidence. All three of us are looking for things. That <laughs> yeah, strange. <laughs> strange coincidence. Oh, that, that <laughs> um, one thing I, I just wanted to sum up my experience with this past year. I actually loved every moment of it. Well, that's not at all true. I loved every moment of working with these three other people, uh, these two wonderful people here and Stephanie as well. I got up every morning as uh, as much of a mess this project was in so many different ways, uh, just the way it was structured, the way we were kind of forced into how we had to uh, break things down. All that, there's all sorts of wonderfully interesting stories that I, I won't ever tell, I uh, can't ever tell, but uh, it's still, I, I never dreaded going into work in the morning. Uh, so I think mob programming is a big part of why that's the case. And I just find it always a wonderful technique to just feel comfortable every day with your team and get a lot of stuff done as well. Uh, as far as plugs, um, go check out my site, langersoft.com. And I've I've got a discount going on upcoming training. I'm like trying to fill in a few things for December. Otherwise, thanks for having me here. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thanks again, uh, all, all three of you for joining us. This is a great conversation. I, I definitely learned a lot hearing your experiences. And uh, to our audience, uh, you know, if you know someone who's interested in cross-continent collaboration, cross-continent mobbing, pairing, that kind of thing, uh, some reteaming, outsourcing, and uh, yeah, finding joy all in, in all of that, uh, despite some, uh, you know, system challenges. Yeah, please share this episode with them. And uh, please like and subscribe and reach out to us on LinkedIn. Uh, Twitter slash X, YouTube and more and uh, mom on and have a good one, everybody. Bye. Bye everyone.